Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hello. Thank you for listening to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we attack our most pervasive fears with truth, because life is too short for any of us to live enslaved. We are passionate about helping you discover, embrace, experience, and live out the full freedom of Christ. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. We can't see tomorrow, but we can hear it. And it sounds like a wind farm powering homes across the country. We're bridging to a sustainable energy future, working today to ensure tomorrow is on. Enbridge, life takes energy. Texting privacy policy in terms and conditions posted at textplan.us. Texting and rules for occurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop, opt out. The pandemic has been hard on all our kids. New studies show more than one in three children who started school in the pandemic now need intensive reading help. Here's the good news. Your child can be reading in just 30 days, guaranteed, with Hooked on Phonics. My first grader was behind in reading, and this program has made a huge difference. She's now reading above grade level. I use it for my kids nightly reading for school. We love it, and it's super easy and quick to do. My kid, who just turned four years old and has been using the program since January of this year, can now read read. Thank you so much, Hooked on Phonics. Even if your child has been struggling, Hooked on Phonics will teach your child to read in just 30 days, guaranteed. And right now, you can get started for just $1. Text the word ABOVE to 323232 right now. It's fast and easy. Text ABOVE to 323232 and teach your child to read in just 30 days, guaranteed. Text the word ABOVE to 323232. Text ABOVE to 323232. I'm Kimmy Miller, and I wonder if you've ever wrestled with the ugly green-eyed monster of envy like I have. I wonder if you too, at some point or another, ever wished your circumstances looked more like so-and-so's over there, you know, where the grass is greener and the flowers a little brighter. I keep hoping that I will outgrow it and reach this point of maturity where I no longer struggle with comparison, but so far it hasn't happened. In fact, just the other day, I was scrolling through my social media feed, and I saw that an old friend of mine had just launched a new website for her ministry. And as much as I want to tell you that my first reaction was pure joy for my friend, I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't. I clicked on that link that took me to her beautiful new site with cool fonts, fresh new colors, and slick hyperlinks, and I immediately compared it to my own site, now appearing less than mediocre in my eyes. And before I knew it, my thoughts were off and I couldn't wrangle them in. And they were coming up with excuses as to why mine looked like a do-it-yourself project gone wrong and how I needed to revise my look if I was going to compete with her. And by the way, who does she think she is anyway, showing off with a brand new, albeit gorgeous website. And just as quickly as that thought came to mind, I was smacked with this one. Kimmy, stop it. You shouldn't think like that. You're supposed to be happy for her. And here's where I struggle. I know how I should respond, but that's not always my first inclination. And being caught between what I want to be true and what I know to be true often leaves me feeling uncomfortable, like wearing a shirt with crooked stitching that doesn't quite fit right. But I keep wearing it because, well, I don't know, I probably got it on sale or something. But the thing is, getting back to my comparison problem, I know God's truth. I know that God has good plans for me and for my friend. But sometimes I just can't get past my own thoughts. I don't want to admit that I have thoughts like this because, well, they make me feel ashamed. And feeling ashamed only makes me want to cover them up, like sweeping them under the rug only to trip on them later. But just because I don't want to think this way doesn't mean that I don't. And pretending these thoughts don't exist, well, that's fake. And I don't know about you, but I just can't do fake anymore. I want to be authentic. And I think you do too. That's why we're here, right? Talking about the things that are keeping us enslaved from being our beautiful, authentic selves. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about comparison. 
Because whether you want to admit it or not, we all do it. Think about it. We compare groceries. We compare the price of gas. We compare schools. We compare neighborhoods. But what trips us up is what we forget about that's working behind the scenes. And that's our knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge we acquired way back in the garden that helps us to determine what's right and what's wrong. See, we often talk about having the knowledge of evil, identifying what's bad or harmful, but we don't ever really talk about the knowledge of good. And here's the thing. If we know what's good, then we know what's better, and surely we know what is best. And this is where things get tricky. When we compare, we're looking to find similarities. How are they alike? What's the same? But what happens when our knowledge of good takes over and suddenly we're no longer just comparing, we're deciding who wore it better. Now we're judging. So not only may we be wrestling with envy, but now we're duking it out with judgment and pride. And it's no wonder that we're shaming ourselves in the corner for having such thoughts. But friend, I want you to give yourself grace. Envy, judgment, pride. Those are all sin, and we're all wrestling with sin. This just happens to be one of its many colors. I wish I could tell you I've discovered the secret to never comparing and judging others or myself, but I haven't. What I have found is how to combat it. And this crazy comfort in knowing that I'm not alone, struggling with comparison isn't new. In fact, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, addresses this very thing in the first book of Corinthians. They, too, were arguing and comparing spiritual gifts, arguing about which one was more important than the other. And Paul uses the analogy of our bodies to help us see the importance each one of us is to the body of Christ and how each has a unique design and purpose that really can't be compared In chapter 12, starting with verse 12, he writes, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. And we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not be for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. I don't know if you've ever stopped to really marvel at the wonder of your body and how it all works together. Or like me, you take it for granted and only notice when it's not working. But when I do take time to appreciate it, to appreciate anything, I'm humbled with gratitude. God really did think of everything. And I believe the key to appreciation has to be rooted in love. In fact, Paul wrote about that too. In chapter 13 of the same letter to the Corinthians, 
you've probably heard it referred to as the love chapter or heard it read at a wedding, Paul stresses the importance of love. He writes, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You see, we have to start with love. When we know how much we are loved by God, it becomes easier to love others. It becomes easier to cheer them on. Love somehow erases the need for competition. Love says we can all win, even when we still battle with sin. My initial thoughts are not always grounded in love, but I'm learning to recognize those that are not so I can replace them with those that are. And here's what I'm learning. When I'm finally honest about my thoughts, like really honest, then Jesus and I can work our way through them. This isn't always easy for me because, like I said before, I'm often ashamed by them. I know they aren't Christian-like. But if I want to be more Christ-minded, then I have to acknowledge the thoughts that aren't. Because then we, God and I, can take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. Just like dealing with any sin, I have to admit it. So friend, I give you permission to admit that you had that thought. Admit that you wanted to be the one who was pointed out for your success. Admit that you wanted to be the one with the new car, the new website. Admit that you wanted what they had. Admit that you didn't want the cards you'd been dealt. Admit all of it. Get it all out there. And if you're like me, I think that longing is authenticity. You don't just want to do what you should. You want to do it because you believe it. Because it's become part of your core values. Because it's who you are. Because it's who Christ died for you to become. And if no one else has told you today, dear one, you are incredibly special. You aren't meant to be like anyone else. From the color of your eyes to the way your pinky finger slightly curves inward, God designed everything about you with purpose. And he did that for all of us. He gave us each talent and skills that are unique to our path. And when I'm tempted to compare myself to others, I remind myself of this truth found in Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. See, the reality is we are all different doing different things. We were all designed to be a unique reflection of God. And when I dwell on the great extent of love and thought God went to, to make up each one of us, I'm overwhelmed and my thoughts are transformed. Instead of envying others, it frees me to genuinely celebrate with them instead. Perhaps that's where authenticity begins. In that place where we give ourselves permission to be honest about what we're thinking and the grace to admit it. It's there, I think, that Jesus does some of his best work. So let's stop beating ourselves up for getting caught up in the comparison trap. 
let's just admit we can all be a little chumpish with our thoughts so we can ask Jesus for help. So we can be the different he made us to be. So we can be those recognized by our love for one another. Those who can genuinely say, I'm so happy for you and mean it. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your unique design of each and every one of us. I thank you that we get to see how creative you are in everything that you do. May we look upon others and celebrate all the diversity that is around us. I break off every curse of comparison in Jesus' name and ask instead, Holy Spirit, that you would fill those places with the joy, love, and admiration of a God that does and makes marvelous things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.